Hello, folks. Um, my name is George Kerevan. I'm a member of the Contour Editorial Board. And uh, welcome to this discussion on uh, the US elections uh, and what next for America. Uh, we've, uh, we've had the election, still in a bit of a limbo as we record, um, but it's clear that Biden is going to be in the White House. So what happens next? We want to try and get behind the headlines uh, from a socialist point of view in analysis and in perspective. Um, we've got three uh, uh, very wonderful uh, speakers who've, uh, who've given up uh, some, of the, some of the time to be with us. Uh, um, first of all, there's uh, Nicole Ashoff. Uh, Nicole, like everybody else, writes for Jacobin in America. Uh, she's on the uh, Jacobin board. Um, she writes about a range of subjects, but particularly um, she's very interested in technology and the politics of technology. Um, a lot of us here in, in this side of the Atlantic will have her, read her book, New Profits of Capital. Uh, she has a new book out, which you might tell us about later, uh, about uh, mobile phones and uh, cell phones uh, if, uh, and, and the, the politics of cell phones. Uh, I've, I've read some of, the, some of the introduction to that. And if you think your cell phone's a nice, safe thing in your pocket, then beware. Um, we've got also Mike uh, uh, McCarthy. Uh, Mike's uh, uh, a, a professor and sociologist at uh, uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee. Um, uh, uh, he's uh, very interested, he's been writing a lot on uh, finance capitalism, which I'm sure we'll get around to. Um, uh, if you don't know anything about uh, Marquette University, um, then the only um, uh, alumni I, that I can think of is uh, um, Mike's namesake, Joe McCartney. Um, John McCarthy. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't know uh, that. But that was a long time yep. ago. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, Doug Henwood, a uh, uh, socialist writer, economist, I understand. Um, also uh, a broadcaster. You can get his, you can Google his, uh, his podcast. And he writes for a magazine called The Nation, uh, uh, which people this side of the Atlantic might not know very much about, which is the longest uh, existing weekly uh, uh, news magazine in America, and it's a it's a reincarnation, a rebirth of its previous uh, title, which was the Liberator, which was one of the great uh, abolitionist journals. Uh, so a very very a very you know, historical part of, of, of the American media. So welcome, uh, uh, folks. Uh, my first question um, is a broad one. Um, America, um, uh, what, 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 what's happening next? And in particular, I'm interested in what um, Trump's defeat means for the American ruling class. I want to go a little bit beyond the parties and think behind that. Um, what does Trump's defeat and Biden being in the White House mean for American capitalism? Um, Nicole, do I to start? Sure. <laughs> um, that's a big question. I think if we think about it in terms of the ruling class and Biden in the White House and the kind of broader crisis of neoliberalism and where we're headed for the next decade, I think Biden will most certainly look to revive neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal capitalism and the kind of multilateral sort of um, you know, globalist, now that's the word we use to describe it, um, kind of politics that have prevailed for the past 40 years. I think there'll be this idea or desire to kind of, quote unquote, get back to normal um, and kind of, um, you know, keep the, the profit-making train going uh, for the ruler class. So I think that they'll probably pretty pretty excited particularly you know if we think about sectors of capital in corporate america uh the big tech companies have to be very excited um about the prospect of biden um getting getting into the white house not only because the, there may be less appetite for uh, this new sort of antitrust turn um, but also um, you know they're hoping that he can repair relationships with china and here it's a little bit um uncertain about what will happen. Um, Biden is certainly making anti-China noises that 
similarly reflect Trump's. Um, so this kind of issue of decoupling and globalization, I think maybe there's an, a sense that we can push back from this um, with, with a Biden um, White House in a way, uh, certainly to kind of, I think there was a sense of the, that the Trump administration was kind of a runaway train when it came to, um, you know, the kind of consensus of the last uh, 40 years in terms of wanting to, to destroy this kind of uh, liberal uh, centrist capitalist model. Now what that means for the ruling class, whether this is a stable coalition, certainly is hard to say. Um, not simply because the country seems divided in a way that it hasn't been for decades, but also the kind of pressures that are destroying the livelihoods of working class people um, have to come to a crisis point at some point. So I, that's all I'll say for now, just to give other folks okay. a chance, okay. but uh, we well, can circle back. Yeah, well, well um, moving on to Mike, I mean, what, what, what are the banks, what does Wall Street think about uh, a Biden administration? Well, if you look at um, like uh, op open secrets and data on, on political spending this, this cycle, uh, not just finance, but actually almost every sector of, of business with the exception of real estate, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, and, uh, and the oil, oil companies, which is not surprising at all, really kind of skewed heavy towards um, uh, Democrats this cycle, which is somewhat of a break from um, the trend in the past where you saw much more uh, bipartisan spending, spending, essentially companies spending for, for both parties just to kind of hedge their bets. Um, and I think, I think that kind of reflects kind of going off what, uh, Nicole was just saying a, a sentiment, um, not just within finance, but within uh, the broader big business community, I would separate this out from small businesses of a kind of hostility to certain aspects of Trumpism. Um, the, the key one I think is, uh, is sort of, uh, uh, uh anti-immigration reforms that Trump has, has pushed through uh, rules with respect to the, um, uh, the HB1 visas um, that we've, we've seen the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers basically um, issue um, lawsuits against the, against the Trump administration over this stuff. So I think, I think we're gonna see a, a kind of revival in a way, at least, at least an attempted one. I don't know if it's politically possible given the, the, the landscape of the country and the, and the divisions, the political divisions, but at least an attempted revival to a kind of 90s uh, neoliberal financial um, sort of model that is you know, trying to promote growth through um, much more open borders. Um, that's, that's the kind of sense that I get from you know, looking at the, looking at the, the spending data. Um, yeah, banks, banks and finance were very much so in, uh, in, in support of the, the Biden presidency. Okay, well, I'll, I'll come on to Doug now, because the, the trouble that I'm having, Doug, uh, over here is, um, you know, the, the, the Trump project must have had some support from some sections of the American ruling class, surely? It wasn't just an aberration that everybody was opposed to. Well, one of the hard things about Trump is that he represents so much uh, that's really classic, deeply rooted in American society, American politics, but a much more intense and crazy and chaotic level. Um, so, you know, in many ways this is status quo only worse. Uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of support among big business uh, for Trump initially. They preferred uh, Hillary, Wall Street preferred Hillary. Um, but um, once he cut their taxes and started deregulating everything, they they lost a lot of their objections. Uh, actually, one of my obsessions over the last decade, I keep threatening to write a book about this and haven't gotten around to it yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm moving in that direction. Um, the, the rot of the American ruling class, which I think is um, a very uh, a, a fractured social formation that unlike the ruling class of the 70s, which was really able to organize itself uh, to promote uh, the, what became the Reagan agenda, um, it hasn't been able to organize itself very effectively. Um, you know, they got their tax cuts, that's all they care about. A proper ruling class, a grown up ruling class would actually have something to do about climate change. Ours can't do anything about climate change. You know, it is really an existential crisis uh, for capital as well as the rest of humanity. And uh, they seem unable to, to organize anything around that. Uh, it was interesting over the last few days to see uh, like the business roundtable and a bunch of CEOs, the business roundtable formed in that 70s period 
uh, to press the, uh, the case of capital, uh, uh, to push deregulation and austerity and all those things that became, came to fruition in the 80s. They organized a conference call of 30 top, well, it actually was not organized. It was organized by Yale business professor, um, a conference call where they just basically said, Trump has to go. He, can't, he has to stop uh, contesting the election and just must go. But that was the first time I'd seen that kind of initiative among the CEO class in a very long time. Uh, and you know, I think they are, what a, part of my um, argument, that they're, they're so rotten, is that all they care about is making money. They, you know, unlike if you look at the, 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 the ruling class of the 1930s and 40s that designed uh, the modern um, architecture of the US empire, uh, these people were very far-sighted. They had very clear notions of where they wanted the world to go. They were capable capable of planning for decades, organizing institutions that might actually involve a little bit of sacrifice in the, of American sovereignty for the short term in order to preserve it for the longer term. And there's just nothing like that. There are no Dean Atchison's or George Kennan's around these days. Um, they're just a bunch of you know jerks like Elon Musk and uh, uh, Jamie Dimon. Now the exception would be the right wing of the ruling class people around Charles Koch and his network, who um, are not terribly happy with a lot of what Trump did. They're certainly not happy about the immigration. They're not happy about the xenophobia. Um, and uh, they've been moving, making gestures towards the, the, the center left. Uh, Van Jones, of all people, is now working with, uh, who is once a Maoist, Bay Area Maoist, and now is um, a kind of mainstream environmentalist and pundit. Um, but they've been working with him to come up with some bipartisan initiatives on uh, a criminal justice. So, but that's the only segment of the American ruling class that's been able to think in the long term. And they've been doing it very cleverly and very strategically for the last 40 years. Um, but they didn't like Trump at all. But they also used uh, their, their closest with Mike Pence to uh, fill um, the administration with a lot of people who think like them. A lot of the deregulatory initiatives came from, from that network. Um, so yeah, I think the right wing is very well organized, um, but uh, the, the, the core of the American CEO class is not so much. Uh, and then I think we also must uh, recognize the fact that Republican party, aside from the presidency, did very well uh, on election day. Yeah, yeah. They consolidated their power at the state and local level often quite dramatically. Um, so this, um, that kind of politics is not going away. Uh, and Biden will almost certainly face a Republican dominated Senate, Senate, which means he won't be able to accomplish much of his agenda. So I don't know, I think, you know, there will be certainly, it, it, it'll be a relief not to have Trump banging our heads against the wall anymore. But uh, I'm not sure that that is gonna be any more than um, a removal of pain. It's hard to believe we're gonna take too many steps in a positive direction. Okay, well, we, before before we leave this topic, <clears throat> let let me let me put a a thesis from you know an, an ignorant uh, Scot on the other side of the Atlantic. I mean, I, I I worry at analysis that somehow reaches a conclusion that Trump, uh, a populist movement with you know seventy million voters in the end, that as as you've said, um, has held on to the Senate. Um, actually took seats away from the Democrats in, in Congress. Um, I, I can't conceive of it simply as a, as a, as a, a political accident uh, that somehow the ruling class were looking somewhere else at the time and this, this madman suddenly appeared. It does seem to me that it's at least worth thinking about that um, the, 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 the high-tech monopoly sector of US capitalism which clearly has, a, as, as, as Nicole said, has, has a vested interest in globalism because it's created, a, it's created international circuits of capital accumulation. But their interests do differ in some extent uh, from uh, domestic capital, domestic capital in America, um, service industries, um, parts of the kind of mid-level manufacturing capacity with domestic markets in the States. I mean, when we look at, 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 at a lot of domestic uh, industry serving domestic markets in the US uh, from a European perspective, we see the prices they charge their domestic customers are higher than in Europe. It used to be the case for you know, a zillion years that, that Europe was a high cost base and American consumers uh, uh, actually had, 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 had people were paying lower costs of the supermarket and therefore wage goods were cheaper for American capitals and gave it an edge. Now, uh, in fact, American domestic capital is being forced to up its prices and maintain domestic monopolies in order to try and maintain its profit levels. You have got competition 
which um, uh, the high tech monopolies have stoked by their alliance with Chinese capital. Uh, so that China has taken jobs away from, from domestic American companies. So it does seem to me it's worth pursuing some kind of split between sections of American capital, certainly between the high tech monopolies and, and, and uh, more, more traditional domestic capital. Um, uh, and, it, it, you know, when you look at some of the people that were funding Trump, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's a cheap kind of analogy, but it's, you know, but it, it, certainly there are some signs that, that he was getting money from uh, some of the model and domestic uh, capital. So I just want to pursue this just, just for a second. Is there any split that you see within the American ruling class? Uh, or is the election of Biden simply going to, you know, close all that gap and we're facing some kind of hegemonic America uh, from the rest of the world? I mean, I don't know what you think of that, Nicole. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at the lens, the corporate landscape of the United States, you see that it's dominated and, and globally, right? You see that it's dominated by these kind of superstar firms in all kinds of sectors, right? Not just tech and banking, but in retail, manufacturing, transportation, right? Um, but below that, you see, you know, mass quantities of small and medium sized businesses, which provide most of the employment in the country. And it's a pretty big divide in terms of the political orientations and sort of vision of these two groups, I would say. They have very different interests. I was just talking to um, a guy I know who's a retired electrical engineer, and now he does consulting for um, companies in the Midwest. And he said, you know, there's all these kind of small businesses who have seen their, um, their business boom under Trump, right? And they're not big kind of flashy um, companies that you would ever see. They're mostly invisible and they're, you know, run by college educated um, people who are very kind of low key and don't have sort of crazy right wing ideas. And he said they love Trump, right? So there's this definitely, I think it's, it's partly difficult to see sort of the divisions in the American ruling class because there's such a stranglehold on our national sort of media that has become so polarized and attuned to getting clicks um, that there isn't any real sort of dogged, a little bit more boring coverage of what the actual sort of political positions of Americans are, whether they're um, you know in the ruling class or not. And so I think when we think about like the point that Doug was making about the lack of far sightedness of the ruling class, I think it really raises the question of, well, you know, the, the ruling class of previous generations had a significant threat, you know, um, coming from below, right? They had to actually be on their toes. Uh, whereas today, you know, you have a very complacent ruling class at the very top because they're fed, you know, the cost of capital and the cost of labor are, are held artificially low by a very activist, um, you know, federal government to make sure that, that you know, the cost of bus doing business is, is uh, is low for, for big corporations. So they do have a shared interest in that respect, but that's quite different from, you know, if you move down to the second and third tier. So I think you really do, you're totally correct and that you have to assess these kind of splits a, a little bit more carefully. Mike, you are, you're warning in, come on. Yeah, it's, I, I think it, and that's also deeply related to the American working class. If you, if you look at, um, if you look at sort of uh, American growth and sort of which, which sectors are taking off and how that relates to job growth, it, it, there's a huge amount of geographic unevenness in the US. I was reading a report a couple of days ago, basically showed that since the Great Recession, two thirds of all the job growth in the US was in 25 large cities. And a lot of, a lot of the distressed areas of, of the US, the Midwest, the, the South actually has seen sort of no job growth since the Great Recession. And you can totally map that onto um, not only where sectors um, of the economy are, it's in the big cities that you find the big financial firms, that you find the big tech firms, that you find, um, you know, big pharma. Um, it's, it's, in the small, it's in the small places um, the sort of distressed places that you find those small businesses. And that's, that to me is uh, that sort of that relationship between these sectors of capital, whether it be sort of different sectors of big business relative to small business is totally tied to how ordinary people are doing in, in the US and how their political appetites sort of move from one, one direction or the other. I mean, it's, if you look at the red areas, the places that stayed red, 
Um, it's 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 in these distressed areas where you don't see you don't see job growth. Um, so that that to me is, I mean, kind of you know going building off what Nicole was just saying. That to me is a sort of very key dividing line in in the American um, uh, business elite. And you can see it sort of come down on different issues. I, I, again, Im immigration to me, I think, is one of the biggest ones. There's a, there's a lot of a, a, the small business pushback um, against sort of uh, more open border policies, whereas bus bus big business are all about getting the, um, the, the cheap labor. You, labor. you can find other aspects in, uh, as well. Um, but yeah, just kind of echoing what, uh, what, what Nicole said and kind of showing how it's related to working class politics as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Doug, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pounce on you. We're going to move on now. So the obvious question next is, what does the left do? I mean, what, what, what does a Biden presidency mean for the left? What should the strategy be? That's, that's for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, thought you were going to sleep. No, no, no. No, no, no. I, I, was, I need to I get my notepad. I thinking about <laughs> um, um, uh, the sectors of capital. Uh, 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 rather than address that. You are, I mean, I don't let me stop you. I just thought right. just, we'd kind of reach the moment. Let me where... just say a couple of things before I get to that. Yeah. One, you know, I think, I don't have these exact numbers, but I think it's something like uh, the 25 top metro areas or so are responsible for two thirds of US GDP and they overwhelmingly vote Democrat. So um, these are richer, but you know, they're also more populous. You know, we always look at this map and see all this red in the, the, the heartland, but they're not very um, thickly populated. It's the densely populated areas uh, that, that tend to vote Democrat uh, and uh, the thinly populated areas that tend to vote Republican. Mm -hmm. So we get, and because of the structure of the US electoral system, where those thinly populated areas are overrepresented, we have a much more Republican skew um, to our um, national politics, and we, we would if we were a more democratic country, uh, small d. Um, I think when all is said and done, uh, the Democratic senators will represent something like 20 million more people than Republican senators, even though the Republicans will control the Senate. So we have this very bizarre system you know, created by slaveholders and their friends um, that uh, the, who, whose malignant influence lives on today. Um, I'd also just want to say that there's almost no support for Trump in Silicon Valley. And, you know, the, the, he got, you know, Musk and uh, Peter Thiel, uh, he was, you know, on his way off to, off, to offshore himself at some point. But, you know, he, the, the, the big tech really likes Democrats um, uh, for various reasons. Um, but I would also want to just emphasize that the, the, the fight with China, now, Trump brought his own particular um, uh, brand of xenophobia and racism and contempt to that. But this is a real thing. The U.S. elites are very concerned about um, the in increasing rivalry, economic, military, political with China, and that's not going to go away under a Biden presidency. He probably Biden won't go and say China, China, China in that ugly way that Trump does, but uh, and he won't call you know COVID the the Wuhan virus or anything like that. But there is still going to be this real tension with China as a rising power. What does the left do? I think the first thing that people have to do is. Um, uh, not let up on criticizing this guy, uh, not be so relieved that we're rid of Trump, uh, uh, that we um, hold back on criticism, give him a honeymoon. No, I think he needs to be pressed from the first. Uh, and, you know, he's, there are some people around his, uh, around his advisory circle who are not bad. I know a couple of his economic advisors uh, who are actually good people. Uh, and um, there's a possibility that uh, there may be some good policies coming out in that direction, but there's also going to be a lot of pressure coming from of the corporate side to uh, just try to return to the status quo ante to try to put together you know the broken uh, all the broken china um, not china all the broken flatware let's say uh, uh, crockery that, uh, that, that 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 trump created in his four years uh, uh but you know it's just not going to happen we're not going to be able to go back to that status quo ante trump was much of a, a symptom of decay as he was a cause of it and uh, yeah, it's just not going to be, it's going to be a, a, the, the political environment coming in the, in the coming months is going to be hor horrifically uh, volatile and, and full of contradiction and struggle. But we really have to make sure that um, a, a relief at, uh, at Trump's defeat does not turn into a complacency. Uh, because, he, you know, I think the, the Democratic Party has made it clear that it almost seems like they are much more afraid or hostile to the left of their own party than they are um, to the Republicans. I always wonder if like, you know, Democrats, establishing Democrats secretly, secretly envy the Republicans and wish they were more like them. Um, uh, because they, you know, they, they're, never, they're always wanting to do these bipartisan efforts to a party that wants to destroy them. 
Um, so, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of effort on the part of Biden to reach out to Republicans, Republicans who want to make sure he fails. And uh, that, that could be uh, produce uh, very disastrous results. Nicole, what, 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 what does the left do? I mean, not just within the Democratic Party, but you know, the broad movements uh, amongst women. I mean, women have been very badly battered by the uh, COVID un unemployment rates, much more heavier amongst women. I mean, how does, the, how does the left react? Well, I mean, I think broadly we have to understand that the Biden victory is not a victory for the left. Um, it's a demonstration of how weak the left is in the United States. And it's, it's, you know, I guess it could be better for the left in the sense that if Trump were elected for a second term, he would feel even more empowered to, um, you know, try to bash whatever kind of, you know, progressive movements are forming around climate change and, um, you know, boosting wages and housing rights and that sort of thing. But Biden is certainly not a victory for the left. And I think one of the interesting ways um, of gauging it is just, you know, reading the Financial Times every day. You know, a year ago, there were nonstop articles about how the Democratic Party needed to move to the left to save capitalism, right? And how it needed to, um, you know, adopt a much more progressive agenda, take calls for um, you know, healthcare and housing and, 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 you know, debt relief for student loans much more seriously. And the moment that Biden is elected, you just hear the tone, uh, you know, completely shift to, uh, we need to not have big expectations for, for Biden. He'll be hemmed in. We can't ask him to do anything unreasonable. Uh, the important thing now is to reach across the aisle um, and make nice with the Republicans. So it's really, um, you know, demonstrative of a, of a broader kind of weakness of the left to have staying power and a, as, a, you know, a voice for working class demands. You know, when we think about um, the role of women, it's, it's grim. You know, if I, it's strange that there are no up-to-date statistics on this, but just the fact that roughly one out of two American students is at home learning remotely um, is huge for women in terms of um, you know, their ability to work. It's like, obviously dads are stepping up and, and helping with caregiving um, duties as well, but the burden is, is falling much more heavily on women, right? So you see this kind of, um, you know, on top of the fact that women are, are more likely to um, be employed in jobs that were lost due to the pandemic um, and are much more likely to be at risk for eviction, losing their health insurance, you know, these homelessness. Um, so you see this kind of tsunami of, um, you know, uh, bad things happening to American women, particularly American women in the working class. And it's not really clear sort of how to actually organize um, to move forward. Uh, I do think that there are some uh, bright spots that come out of the election. Certainly the fact that there is um, a sustained kind of support for single payer healthcare, which of course would help women immensely. Um, the fact that even in places like Florida, you see support for $15 an hour. Um, and that we're actually, you know, there's this big fear about this, um, you know, avalanche of evictions that would happen in the fall when the eviction moratoriums, um, you know, were lifted. In Massachusetts, our Governor Baker actually brought back 15 retired judges to, uh, you know, power his eviction machine to go through the backlog of all of these um, evictions that hadn't been processed. But there's been a lot of activism actually to push back against that. So I think these are the kinds of things that, while not necessarily, you know, flying the feminist flag, right, um, do disproportionately affect and, and benefit women in terms of um, you know, their ability to support their household. So I think that's, you know, one kind of bright spot. If I could just interject quickly, the, um, <laughs> another bright spot uh, is the, um, the victories by a lot of democratic socialists in America uh, supported and, and, and supported by our friends, uh, candidates in state and local elections. Um, uh, whole, you know, uh, the New York State uh, uh, legislature will now have a socialist caucus really uh, starting uh, next year. Uh, and an awful lot of the, the successful candidates are women. 
um, and uh, a lot of the rising stars on the left of the Democratic Party and on the American left more broadly are women. So there is um, uh, that that is inspiring, especially coming at you know the the macho blowhardery of four years of Donald Trump. It's 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 a real relief to see that happen. And these victories at the state and local level are very important. And I always thought that the the Sanders campaign was in some sense it was catalytic and really transformative in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, the presidency is the bourgeoisie's office, and there's no way they're going to give that up easily. But if you can organize at the state and local level, um, you can actually win uh, elections and also build a movement. So I think that that, that is something that's really uh, un uh, unambiguously positive that's coming out of, uh, out of, out of the recent elections and, and you know, the organizing um, outside the electoral system as well. Mike, your turn, but you might add a question, an answer question to mine, which is, of course, Sanders is not going to be around next time, I presume. Uh, so who, in, who is going to be the standard bearer of the left in the next election cycle? Great question. Um, yeah, I would just, I, I guess I introduce a little more, a little more um, skepticism and pessim pessimism here. I, I think the out outcome of the of the elections is specifically uh, the issue that this is going to be a divided government. There's it's very unlikely that um, the there's going to be a unified democratic government um, where Biden can get things passed. Of course, he can he can do a lot with executive orders. He can try to get us back into, you know, the Paris Accord. He can try to get us back signed signed on to the um, World Health Organization, you know, the the nuclear deal, but. He's, he's probably not going to be able to get um, funding for any of those things. He's probably not going to pass his, his, uh, the more progressive aspects of, of his plan that he's put forward, like the public option or uh, bigger investments in green tech, or um, maybe he'll do infrastructure because business actually wants that quite a lot. But, um, but I, think it's, I think this is actually pretty dire for the left because what's, what's going to happen is, is that there has to, there's going to be appeals to bipartisanship there's going to be a sort of need to sort of distance the the core of the party from from its left. You've already seen that with folks like Abigail Spamberger saying we can't even say socialism any, anymore. We've already seen that in 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 different sort of state races where folks are saying you know the whole idea of defund the police is why we lost by or we won by such mar small margins and so on and so forth. And I think the effect of this is actually going to be a marginalization of our politics um, within the party. And I and. And for for that going forward, I think that that means we're going to have to step up our 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 politics outside of the party. That just doesn't mean that we shouldn't support folks like AOC who are still sort of are you know putting in the good fight and all, and other folks that have been supported by by organizations like the DSA. But I think it means that in terms of you know the next the next four years, like it's 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 going to be pretty tough a pretty tough fight internal to the party. Um, and so I think I think that's that is going to lead to sort of much more of sort of movement orientation for the left, um, in much the same way that you saw under the under the Obama administration, um, where sort of the the left had to engage more in sort of uh, politics of protest than than sort of the long march to the institutions as such. Um, but but yeah, the leading light. I I mean it's you know it's hard it's hard to imagine Bernie Bernie going at it again. But uh, you know the folks, the folks that I see that are you know s really sticking to their guns and sort of sticking to message and and promoting the pol the policies that I think um, America desperately needs. I mean, we can't forget uh, at the end of December, 12 million people are going to lose massive amounts of benefits. It's a, you know, there's there's a there's a benefit cliff that we're that we're reeling towards. That there's no clear sign that there's going to be a policy response to. That that means that these are this is going to have to be a, pol a politics of the street, and the 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 to me the the folks that are our leading lights in the party right now, they're going to serve they're going to serve a, a leadership role if they can step up in that moment and help mobilize folks on the on the street. So I don't I don't know if that's going to happen, but I think that's that's what that what that's what needs to happen because the the structure of of the government right now isn't such that we're going to get very progressive policies. I just it, I don't see that happening at all. In that, if we, we run with that for a moment and we assume that um, Saunders doesn't run again, um, that Biden shifts to, to the center and the right, having got his feet under the table, under the resolution desk, um, 
the missing name here is Trump. Um, does Trump retire to the golf course? But if he doesn't, how does that then impact? I'm struck by something that, that, that Mike just said about the, uh, the benefits cliff that's coming. Um, because I was intrigued by the fact that um, uh, Trump went in a slightly different direction. He went in a kind of Bolasaro direction compared to European governments in that actually, you know, the, the, the emergency benefits, because they were inadequate, et cetera, et cetera, but the emergency benefits that went to some of the uh, poorer families in America were in terms of their income base quite high. And I was wondering whether there was some impact on Trump's electoral success of the fact that, you know, he gave people a lot of cash after March. And if that cash disappears uh, under a Biden administration, and you've got Trump out there, you know, still spitting fury, then the possibility of, of, the, of the populist movement um, continuing to have an impact and taking Biden out on the right still remains. So question really is, it's a long way of saying, I mean, what's, what's, Trump, what's Trump's capacity for mischief? Or the, what's the capacity of, 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 of the populist movement, uh, Trump or no Trump? Uh, what's the impact on American uh, politics? Uh, Doug? Yeah, I would say, first of all, that Trump had almost nothing to do with that uh, rescue package. <laughs> he doesn't pay any attention to details. Uh, that came out of Congress. Uh, and he had many opportunities to intervene to extend these uh, benefits uh, in recent months, and he refused to get involved with it, really. He would every now and then tweet, do something, but he'd actually, he never did anything to work Congress. He, I'm sure he didn't even know how Congress worked. Uh, he probably didn't, couldn't even pass your basic <laughs> civics text on the, how to build becomes law kind of exercise. Um, as to what he does, in the future, uh, well, I'd also say that you know the fact that the reason that, that these benefits are ending is Mitch McConnell, and it's it's not Joe Biden. And if Biden actually makes that clear, and Democrats make that clear, instead of rolling over and you know letting somebody else control the narrative, then you know that that might hurt the Republican Party uh, as people, um, you know, 13 million people are going to lose their benefits in a couple of weeks. It's just a, a frightening possibility, um, and that's the only thing. You know, we can talk about uh, uh, th that. That rescue package, the CARES Act that uh, passed in March or April, was a, one of the most massive interventions uh, in, in American history. And it was very successful, a very successful fiscal policy, a very successful income support policy. It really was a re remarkable that it passed and it was very effective. It did what it was supposed to have done. And uh, we're still sort of uh, running off the fumes of that. But now the question about what Trump does is you know, the problem with that guy is he doesn't have the uh, attention uh, span to. Uh, do anything sustained. So who knows? I mean, he may have suffered such a narcissistic wound that he's going to be uh, just sh shrink off and play golf, or he um, just will be run, uh, motivated by nothing but bitterness and run some sort of stab in the back, you know, uh, Hitler-esque campaign. Um, so we, we just can't, you can't predict what that guy's going to do. And he's, you know, going to do one thing one day and something else the next. So, um, and I think, you know, people, um, point to this populist movement that 70 million votes he got. Um, certainly the raw material for that is there, but he also did call a lot of it into existence and sustain it. I mean, he was an important leader. You know, sometimes the individual is a, a, an important figure in politics. And I think that's his case because the rest of the Republican package is not very popular at all, but uh, you know, uh, the personality of Trump uh, sold a lot of stuff that might not have sold if it were just up to Mitch McConnell. I think it's really, really hard to predict uh, what, what's going to happen. But yeah, we do need to have you know, action in the streets. But also, you know, the left wing of the Democratic Party is growing. They're going to be what? The squad is going to grow to seven, uh, I guess, uh, next year. Um, there are all these you know, figures it, it rising around in state and local government. So it's not like the left is uh, weak in the Democratic Party. It's very funny uh, to hear Abigail Spanberger, a former CIA agent denouncing yeah. socialism. You know, she used to work for an agency that uh, was pretty much formed to fight socialism. So here she is doing her job. Uh, you, 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 you're sitting here in Europe and, and listening to the narrative of American politics of the last year, you know, with Trump and the, and the Republicans, Republicans denouncing radical socialism in America. It just, it just it, even if it's not true, it's just a joy to the heart to hear those words being, uh, being spoken. Nicole, Nicole, um, is the is the is the uh, populism after Trump? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always uh, thought it was really important for the left to emphasize and re-emphasize the fact that Trump is a symptom of a deeper problem 
and he is the result of a deeper problem. Um, and so Trumpism, if we want to call it that, which is a really ugly term, um, but the kind of strongman, authoritarian, nationalist type of uh, political image and vision that he projects is extremely popular in the United States. Um, and that's not going to go away, right? These fears that people have about um, immigration and China and their slipping livelihoods amidst the, these kind of uh, culture wars that are stoked by media companies to get clicks is not going to go away. I mean, the, the CNN and the New York Times must be must be freaking out. I mean, this has been their business model for the past four years, right? To uh, you know, kind of the nonstop Trump parade. So I, I don't think it's going to go away. And I think that if the left doesn't actually sort of reach out and try to develop a, a politics um, that actually you know, reaches working class voters in a way that's meaningful, you're just, the next Trump is, is going to be much scarier um, and smarter and know how, uh, you know, a bill becomes a law. So uh, I think it's something to, to be concerned about, um, certainly. Mike, how do we stop the next Trump? Well, I, I, think, I think Nicole just hit, it, hit, hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, we seem to be in a, a prolonged legitimacy crisis. Um, I, I struggle to see the actual um, support for um, returning to kind of uh, Obama style politics um, in the actual electorate. There's, there's durable deepening inequality. I mean, just last week, there is uh, almost 700 and I forgot the exact number, almost uh, 750,000 new unemployment claims. So we're moving in the other direction now. Um, there's, there's been sort of very weak, uh, stagnant recovery since the great recession in most places. It's gotten worse in a lot of places. And, and to me, you don't, you don't turn, you don't turn that, um, into sort of positive politics by, by appealing to a kind of middle of the road, um, pragmatic, um, you know, we can, we can make everybody happy politics of, of Biden. I think that, I think the failure to articulate a politics of the left um, within the Democratic Party is precisely the reason why Trump has had so much hold, how his rhetoric has been able to sort of give people a sort of a reason for the problems that, that, that exist in their life, a sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's a narrative. And to, to, to kind of, to beat that, we need, a, we need a narrative that actually explains people's problems. And the, that narrative is not one that, um, that Biden is, 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 grasp, is, 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 uh, is, is putting out there. It's certainly not one that you know, folks like Nancy Pelosi are putting out there. It's, uh, and it's, it's one that I think if the, the Democratic Party as a whole you know, keeps, on, keeps on sort of moving away from, um, I, 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 struggle how, I struggle to see how they're gonna have long-term um, success, unless there's just a miraculous recovery. I think that's, I think that's maybe the one thing that the, that the party is really hoping, hoping for, you know, if we can get, if we can get some sort of miraculous recovery, um, you know, jobs come back uh, booming, American capitalism is roaring again, you know, then they have a, then they have something to stand on. But if, if, if we are continuing in the same trend that we've been going down since 2007, I think, I think you have to articulate that alternative narrative. And that, that means actually embracing the left of the party. Okay, well, let me move on to the next thing that was in my mind, which is, and it, it flows on from your reference to the future of the economy. Um, I mean, we've had a, a decade and more since the big bank crash of um, Western governments simply printing money, um, creating an asset boom, uh, and that sent stock markets um, sky high, despite um, profit levels not justifying that. Um, the COVID crisis has provoked a new round of quantitative easing and money printing. Um, and stock, you know, bizarrely, stock prices are back up again. I mean, there comes a point when this asset bubble um, must burst. And the underlying um, strength of the global economy, the capitalist economy, is has not, it's very weak, has not recovered since the first decade of the, of the century. Um, you have American Chinese capital going head to head over um, a, a new wave of investment in, in, 
in technology. Um, uh, how um, sorry, that went blank. So uh, sorry again. So my, my my question is: You are right in saying that the the political future is very much premised on what happens economically. So where do you guys see the American economy? I mean, there'll be some kind of bounce back from uh, 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 the COVID recession, but in, in a more strategic sense, uh, what's the state of the American economy? Where is it going? Um, um, Mike, Mike first. Well, I guess I'd, uh, one thing I just point out, is, and it's, I mean, you read about it a little bit in the financial press, a little less um, in left analysis, but you know, going going into this, I, I mean, one, I'm I, the bulk of what of of this downturn is absolutely driven by the the uh, COVID nineteen. There's there's no there's no getting around that. But but the 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 pandemic is happening in a context in which there's been an incredible debt crisis that's been deepening, um, not just for American firms, for, but for firms all around the world, and it's particularly acute for small and medium sized firms. Um, the large, large firms, the, 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 the big performers, um, you know, they're not saddled with as much debt as these small and medium sized firms. And I think that is, that is, that is going to be an underlying sort of problem um, going, going forward, because, you know, eventually firms are going to have to pay back the debt. Eventually, they're going to have to sort of uh, get profit margins up to, such that they can kind of um, deal with it. And I think that is that there's a, there's a very real risk of, of defaults. On 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 American corporate debt, um, it's it's not quite as bad actually for consumer debt and actually and actually credit card debt is actually going down quite a bit, but if you look at corp corporate debt, um, it's it's uh, pretty pretty nasty and I and I I think that sort of that poses some real problems um, going forward and it's precisely again going back to what we said about geographic unevenness. Who are these firms? Where are the small businesses? Who are who are the companies that are sort of settled settled with that? Again, it's 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 firms that are sort of located in, in in parts of the U.S. disproportionately. I'm not saying entirely, disproportionately, in parts of the U.S. that have strong red support. Um, it, again, it's in these it's in these distressed areas of of the U.S. So if so, that to me that, that that's a sort of that to me is a durable problem that's going to extend beyond the pandemic. And if there's if there's sort of subsequent sort of economic fallout in in the financial sector, I think it's going to hit there first, far 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 well before it hits um, places like San Francisco and New York. And that that to me is going to, you know, just deepen you know the the problem of Trumpism unless we have some sort of um, answer to it. Doug, where's the economy going? Well, I, I just want to underscore the point that Mike was making. Um, yeah, the only major sector of the U.S. economy that added debt after the Great Recession was the corporate sector, uh, particularly non-financial corporate sector. Uh, a lot of that, I think, was in fracking. A lot of the, uh, the fracking boom was financed by debt, which is now going sour. And Trump tried to bail them out, but I don't think he's going to get it all done. Um, but you know, households actually reduced their indebtedness, and they've continued to in all recent months. Uh, but they spent 10 years uh, reducing their indebtedness. Um, and uh, uh, banks too have actually been fairly prudent. Uh, they hadn't haven't gotten. Well, you never know what they're doing, you know, out of view. But it looks like they've been uh, uh, pretty prudent. And so uh, that kind of broad financial crisis that like, uh, that we saw in two thousand eight doesn't seem likely to repeat itself. Yeah, but, but there will be some corporate defaults. Um, but a lot of those um, debts are held by hedge funds and such, and might not have all that brought an economic effect. Whether it's going to have a kind of political effect that Mike was talking about, I don't know. Um, you know the, the, certainly the fracking business is, is concentrated in a few areas. Uh, and, uh, but they've already lost a lot of employment. Um, you know, one of the striking things about the, uh, these claims around Trump and, and, and uh, in the heartland is that there really was no job recovery in these uh, areas that he was trying to encourage. There's no steel recovery. There's been very little in oil and gas. You know, all this kind of filthy extractive industries he's trying to promote 
have not generated the kind of employment that his rhetoric would have made you think, or, you know, that, that stupid Foxconn deal in Wisconsin, which produced about 11 jobs or something. I mean, it's just been, uh, that, that, the, the idea that he's actually delivered something to the people he supposedly um, has been uh, promising it to is, is, is way at odds with the facts. Now, I know facts uh, don't always go very far in politics. Fantasy and delusion have a lot to do with it as well. So uh, Trump is a master of fantasy and delusion. Um, but uh, yeah, if you look at where we were before the COVID crisis hit, the unemployment rate was down three and a half percent or so, uh, which, you know, it's classically the point which is say overheating, the stock, the financial markets are overvalued and frothy. Federal Reserve should step in and tighten, generate a, a, a bear market in a recession. That would be a normal textbook thing to do. Then this virus hit and we added, you know, all kinds of public and private debt uh, in, in, during this period. Um, it's going to take a long time to get anything back anywhere near on a growth track. You know, the, we're at something like $13,000 uh, per, in per capita GDP, where we would be had we continued in the growth path from 27, 2007 onwards. I mean, that's how poor the recovery from that crisis was. Um, so um, yeah, there are all these really very, very serious underlying problems. And then it's you know, sickly confused. The business cycle has been completely confused by this virus. Um, so it's quite possible that if we get a vaccine and people are allowed to go outdoors again uh, and start feeling, uh, I don't know, maybe in the mood for some kind of roaring 20s style celebration of uh, you know, what came after the 1918 flu. I mean, there's always that possibility, but you know, th these underlying, the underlying rot is not going to go away. So you know, it's just gonna come crashing down at some point or you know, hit a wall somehow, but you know, it could happen two, three years from now. No, I actually I take what you say about consumer debt and states having gone down, uh, which is the opposite from from Europe, and particularly from UK, where um, consumer debt has actually has gone back to where it was pre the, the, the 2008 crisis. And that might be the weak point here. But uh, Nicole, what, what, what's your prediction for the economy? Well, I think it just if we think about um, before the pandemic, we were on the tail end of, you know, a decade of just weird macroeconomics, right? I mean, you have these kind of experts who are looking at the global economy and scratching their head and saying, I don't really know why wages aren't going up or inflation isn't going up. I mean, we're in this, you know, long sort of stagnant, um, you know, trend where central banks and you know, the Federal Reserve is just sort of artificially keeping interest rates low to just kind of keep the, the boat steady for a really long time. And you keep thinking, well, at some point, you know, inflation's going to go up and or, or wages are going to go up. And it's just year after year of this kind of um, policy to the point where, you know, the new normal is these like 0% interest rates, right? And so now we see that's, you know, it's like we're turning to monetary policy again, monetary stimulus, uh, you know, during the pandemic to try to keep things uh, rolling. You know, the Fed is buying $80 billion a month in, in treasury bonds. But to me, it's like a, a really big question of sort of how long, um, what does this mean, right, for our understanding of sort of like how capitalism evolves historically? It's a strange moment. And I mean, granted, two decades is not a very long um, time or one decade, right? Um, but it does raise these kind of questions of, you know, we keep expecting or discussing, um, you know, well, there's going to be a big bubble in corporate debt, right? Well, I mean, maybe, um, but we there's a there's a a real political willingness to just keep, you know, printing and pumping money, and there's no real sort of uh, political backlash to that. Yes, we have Trump and we have a super divided country, but the, in terms of geo, geo, geopolitics, right, uh, the US dollar is, is, is strong and you don't really see any pressure to increase uh, the cost of wages and in, inflation isn't going anywhere. So it's, it's really a, a question mark for me, sort of what the implication, what does this mean um, uh, moving forward? And, and I don't think we really know. Right, last question, you've done very well. Um, uh, the last question is, right, you, you're obviously, you guys, for very obvious reasons, focused on what's happening internal to America. The rest of us, you know, sit and work, watch you because you're the, America is the elephant in the, in the global room. So what does the Biden presidency mean um, for the rest of the world? 
who should we go for? Mike. Uh, that's a, that is a great question. Um, well, I think, I think that's probably where the Biden presidency is going to have the biggest impact in a way. Um, I, I'm pretty convinced that domestically he's not going to be able to do much um, because of uh, Republican blockage, but he will have some 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 room to you know open up new relationships with 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 old partners. I'm sure I'm sure he's ready to kind of normalize relationships with folks in in Europe again. Gets to get more sort of um, going back to that old style um, in the past, but I, I, I again I. I I don't think he's going to be able to do much, um, much domestically. But so what, what? What we'll probably see is a return to commitments uh, of things like the the World Health Organization, um, the Paris Accords, um, these 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 various kinds of, kinds of international commitments that that he's going to make. Which, frankly, I think he's going to make without any real financial backing to do anything about. Um, that's that's my sense. And he, he's already announced that he's not going to change Trump's policy on recognizing Jerusalem as, uh, as, the, as the capital of Israel. So clearly, it's, you know, there are some bits of Trumpism that are going to remain. Nicole, um, what do you think? Uh, Again, Biden meets the rest of us. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, for the last, you know, two years, or at least since this trade war that Trump has started with China, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, American corporations uh, reorganizing their their supply chains and uh, decoupling, and sort of an intensification of, um, particularly, well, you know, it depends on the industry, right? So it's easy for some um, companies like apparel. To, to move out of China and move somewhere else. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but there's a lot of, there was a lot of pressure coming from the Trump administration to, um, you know, toward US tech companies to tell them to, to move out of China and to, to you know, completely tear up and re, re, or, re, rework their, their value chains. And I think that we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, and so what does Biden mean for that, right? For, for globalization? I mean, Xi just was talking to APEC and it was like decoupling is out. Uh, we, are, we are sticking with the globalization model and we are gonna push that. So what does Biden do in that kind of a situation, right? Like maybe he wants to work himself back into these kind of multilateral arrangements. Um, the US isn't in the same position it was four years ago, right? He can, he can you know, Talk about NATO and 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 re rejoin the World Health Organization or resupport them and try to revive the WTO, but it's we're not in the same place we were four years ago. I'm not sure you can just sort of set the dial back. So and also, you know, B Biden is firmly in the kind of uh, U.S. centrist consensus of being anti-China and being concerned about the rise of China's uh, tech capacities. So it'll it'll be interesting to to see. Again, it's, it's too, too soon to tell. And Doug? Yeah, I think the China thing is very important because we're talking, um, you know, as, as Nicole just said, they're, they're improving tech capacities um, are, are um, I think, more and more worrying Silicon Valley. Uh, I think, I believe last year uh, was the first time that China surpassed the U.S. the number of patents. Um, that sort of thing, you know, it's, it's a crude indicator, but you know, that, that, that does suggest that China is getting much more technologically sophisticated. And all these supply chain arrangements, which are based on China being a low wage, you know, commodity producer, um, may become increasingly irrelevant as China it becomes its own um, uh, uh, self-sufficient tech power. Uh, and no longer subordinate uh, in U.S. supply chains. Um, so, how they handled that, and you know, what the, what fourteen or so Asian nations just signed a trade pact uh, to which the U.S. is not a party. Uh, China, of course, with the dominant party in that arrangement. Uh, what will this does this signify? Signify a growing um, Asian uh, uh, region that's uh, independent of the U.S. Um, or will Biden be able to slip his way into there and, and reassert U.S. influence? Um, you know, I'm sure, of course, you know, as people have said, the, uh, the 
uh, we'll be back in good graces with NATO again and the Paris Accords, but of course, uh, we probably won't be able to deliver on any commitments in the Paris Accords, but we can certainly at least join the rejoin the formal procedure. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, as Nicole said, it's not the world it used to be. Uh, Trump may have accelerated uh, U.S. Uh, stature internationally, but it was declining beforehand, and it's going to continue to decline. That's just the long-term trajectory. And we're just, we don't seem like the kind of country that's going to um, uh, see uh, uh, accept its decline in imperial status graciously. I think we'll, we'll probably go down very nastily and want to take some people down with us. So it, uh, it could get ugly. Yeah. Well, um, uh, President Biden should be in Glasgow in Scotland um, this time next year uh, for the COP26 uh, summit on climate change. So um, maybe you guys would like to come back online then and we'll see what's happened in, in 12 months. So um, before we go, um, uh, we need to do a bit of advertising. So um, Nicole, what's, what's the latest book and where can we get it? Uh, my new book is called The Smartphone Society, Technology, Power, and Resistance in the New Gilded Age. It's Beacon is the publisher. Um, you can get it anywhere, including Amazon, although <laughs> it's better for me if I you was, don't I buy from Amazon, Amazon and better for small bookstores, but you can get it anywhere. Um, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Now, we, 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 we've got some good, good radical bookshops here, so we, 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 will, we will pump that. Um, uh, Mike, you're, you're working on a new book for Verso, yes? Yeah, for, for a little while now, although I got to say the pandemic has set me back a little bit. <laughs> Child care is, uh, is cutting into writing time <laughs> significantly. But yeah, I'm working yeah. on one called, the, called the, the, the Master's Tools is the tentative title. And it's, it's basically a, um, a book about the politics of finance. So it's, it's thinking really about how financial power is mobilized in politics and how the working class and American workers can mobilize finance for their own interest. And so it's kind of taking a, taking a political, political lens to a, to a typically um, a subject that's typically thought of in purely economic terms. Good. Well, we look I'm, forward I'm, to it. I'm trying to be uh, Doug Henwood uh, version 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> and Doug are, you, Doug, are you writing anything? Well, I'm about to actually write for my blog a, a, a little piece on uh, the state of the U.S. labor market, how, how extensive the recovery has been, what it's looked like, and what, what, what remains to go. Um, where, where, do, where do we get your blog? Um, it's lbo-news.com, lbo-news.com. And uh, then um, I do intend very soon to get very serious about writing this book in the Rod of the American ruling class, um, because it, uh, it just seems like a never, an, ever, an evergreen topic. Because the American ruling class is really uh, a rotten thing. <laughs> well, I think I think that's an excellent excellent note uh, to finish on. Well, thank thank you all of you, uh, Nicole, Mike, and Doug, for for a very interesting uh, uh, examination of what's going on in, in Biden's America. Um, I'm George Kervin. I'm speaking to you for Conter, and you can uh, look Conter up on on Google, or you can find us on Facebook. Um, hope you've enjoyed the talk.